like you do, not like you do. No one can love me, hold me, take care of me. My heart beats just for you, baby. Hi, it's Justin Clutter of Sonic Scoop, and welcome back for some more MixCon. And today we are back with a masterclass with Richard Furch. He is a rare producer, mixer, engineer. He's worked with a tremendous number of major pop and R&B and hip-hop artists. Artists like Frank Ocean, Jay-Z, The Weeknd, Rick Ross, Snoop Dogg, and so many more. And he's also a rare mixer in the respect that he's one of the few that we've ever invited back on for another MixCon. In the 10 years of doing MixCon, that's only happened a very small number of times, and I'm happy to have Richard as one of them. The last time he was here, he was talking about stereo mixing versus Atmos mixing and how to move back and forth between the two. But today he's going to be diving deep into reverb, which is something that he is a master at and a real aficionado for. He's a big fan of great reverbs, having owned so many of the most popular and most famous hardware digital reverbs over the years. But he is now using reverbs all in the box, having sold a whole bunch of his favorite hardware reverbs in favor of plugins, particularly the Relab LX480 plugin, which offers a sample accurate emulation of the original classic lexicon reverbs that you'd find in so many of the biggest studios around the world. So this will be a true masterclass on mastering your use of reverbs, thinking about how to select reverbs, how to set their lengths, how to think about things like pre-delay, what kinds of processing you want to do before or after going to a reverb. Richard covers all of that and a whole lot more. Like all of our MixCon masterclasses, this one is free to the public thanks to our sponsors, and the sponsor here is a super natural fit. It is Relab, who make some of the best reverb plugins out there, including that LX480, which is an exact emulation of the original hardware lexicon reverbs that Richard went as far as to sell his old super high-end lexicon hardware reverb just to use Relab's plugin emulation of that classic reverb. That's not the only famous reverb they've got in plug-in form. They have the new VSR Rev 6000, which emulates the hardware TC Electronics reverbs, as well as the Sansig reverb, the Sansig Dimensional Expander, and the Masselec MEA2, one of my favorite mastering EQs of all time, and an EQ that makes it into my mastering template for every session that I do. So big thanks to those guys for helping make this one free to the public. But in this masterclass, we are going to get unfiltered the real truth about how Richard uses reverb, how he thinks about it, and his own recommendations for how you might consider using reverb in your own mixes. If you're here for the live premiere and you have any questions as this masterclass is going along, feel free to type them into the chat box right there on your screen. I'll be saving the best questions for a live Q&A that's going to happen right after the premiere of this masterclass. We are also giving away more than $5,000 worth of free gear, including plugins, speakers, microphones, and more. So check that out over at the MixCon Mega Giveaway. We'll leave the link for that in the description and in the comments down below. So good luck to you. There are three chances to win that one. All right, without any further ado, let's get right into this MixCon Masterclass from the one and only Richard Furch. Richard, take it away. Hello, everybody. I am Richard Furch. I'm here at Just For The Record in Los Angeles. We're on a little bit of a field trip because my studio is being upgraded to Atmos 9.1.4. So it's not quite camera ready, but these guys got me. So check them out, Just For The Record. Now, I also wanted to shout out Sonic Scoop and MixCon and Justin Coletti for having me back after a year. Last year, we talked about stereo and Atmos. And I also wanted to thank Relap Development, Martin, and the two Randys for making awesome reverbs. We couldn't do it without you, and I basically stare at your stuff all day long. So without further ado, let's get into it. First things first, how did we get here? If you ask me, actually, any time in the last three years, seven years, ten years, I would actually say I am a reverb connoisseur. And I don't mean that in a snobby way. Uh, You can (laughs) use your reverb however you wish. But more like I I do care about reverb and ambiences quite a bit because I think they make a lot of the record. They define the, the sound, duh, of course, but they give you like an approach to the record, so to speak. And it's also one of the bigger things that we can change about a record while still being subtle, while still enhancing the original intention that the producer had or the artist had, et cetera, et cetera. But that's why it was important to me. And I'd tell you how I got there because at the beginning of in the box mixing, I personally thought, you know, there were a lot of plugins that are really good 
on the EQ compressor side, etc., that actually really worked. You know, like, I mean, just to shout out a few, the Metric Halo channel strip, the R comp and the R Vox, which are still being used because they're just great in their work. So making a record with these tools was actually possible and great. But there were these struggles that we had. Like one thing that I noticed was that the reverbs were making things sound a little bit more claustrophobic. And I couldn't quite pinpoint why that was. There was just this feeling that a lot of plugins, and I'm not naming any because everybody like basically pushed the technology forwards. They felt instead of like actual reverb, they felt like a bunch of delays. And those delays made the sound opaque instead of transparent and like being behind the scenes, so to speak. I had an Anita Baker session. And so I used what I would normally use, which is some plate plugin. And she complained in a way like, that doesn't sound like verb to me. And of course, my first reaction was, I don't understand that this is reverb. And she said, can you use some hardware reverbs? The ones that are in the room here. I'm like, sure. So uh, the first one that was available was the PCM70. And I gave it to her in the headphones and she immediately went, there it is. This is the sound. And I listened back to it and I was like, that's right. That is the difference. So from that day on, I, I went on a shopping spree and a lot of problems were solved, especially with the Lexicon 4ADL, a flagship reverb of the 80s. And I was like, there's that sound I remember. And things became easier. The sound I was looking for became available again. And then years passed and plugin companies announced, here's your new great reverb. And in many cases, I was like, well, this sounds really great, but not as great as this hardware review that I have here. So I can't quite get rid of what, <laughs> what I already have solved, so to speak, until Relab came out with their line of reverbs. And the first one was the LX480. And, you know, I tried it. I was like, oh, that's nice. And it took me about a year, I suppose. And, you know, we're all a little superstitious, but I A-beat and A-beat and A-beat. And it's like, this is the same, isn't it? And finally, I was like, I think this is the same. This solves the same problem. I have the hardware reverb, I can confirm what I want. And at that point, finally, I sold my 480 and started using the Relab version exclusively. And then over time, other software replaced other hardware reverbs. So at this moment, I am without my hardware reverbs. And let me talk about those four different ways a reverb is actually classified for me. In one place, you have number one, like a vocal reverb, something that's like two seconds long, a plate or hall or something like that. That's the space of the record. That is one version of reverb. A second one would be the ambient, something really short that gives you a little space around the instrument, um, well, or vocal for that matter. Uh, maybe sets it back a little bit. That would be a second one. Then you have the special effect, the spring reverbs, the stuff that's definitely not natural, but has a vibe to it. That is something that very often comes from production, not necessarily from mixing. Well, it could, you know, it could be a request or it could be an inspired thought, so to speak. But lastly, then you have throws. Reverb that comes in at the end of lines, you know, going into space, et cetera, like that. So what we're talking about mostly is the first two, the big vocal verb and the, the ambience and how to approach that, maybe how to choose that too. So I brought a session here from an artist called Leela James, R&B artist. I've done four albums for her. This one is from last year. I think this one got her a number one on the R&B charts. It's called Right Back In It. I'm just going to play you a little bit and show you the session. I'm just going to play here from the verse to the chorus so you have idea what this sounds like to begin with. Can't deny it. Don't nobody love me better. Don't nobody give not like you do, not like you do No one can love me, hold me, take care of me My heart beats just for you, baby Oh, you know I've been missing you And we're right back in it and it's on again yeah. And it's better than, yeah. than it's ever been Yeah, we're right back in it and it's on again It feels so right Ooh, this is what love And 
before anybody is like crucifying me, these vocals here are on three different vocal tracks. And it's because the recording was dark and brighter and dark and brighter. And it was easier for me to do that, to put it on different tracks than automate the vocals. So this is not a common thing I do, but hey, you do what you have to do. Remember this moment, I will probably uh, refer to it back later, but we're gonna go here to the bridge because there's a more normal looking vocal here. So like I said, the 480L, so many records. I mean, it's all the 80s, all the 90s, basically that's vocal verbs. So here is one, for instance. As you see, I love it so much. I have four, and to describe them real quick. So we have a plate here for the backgrounds, it's kind of short-ish and wide. I'll talk about that in a moment. We have buckram. If you know the unit, this is kind of like almost like an explosive little reverb that it is a kind of plate-ish, but it like it kind of has a rhythmic factor to it. Then the plate, very much straight ahead plate that I really love. Lastly, we have the auto park. It's more like an ambience that's very long, dark, it gives you that sound like. Whew. So anyway, these will be in my template at the start. In many cases, I try a few of these and settle on them depending on the program material, on how fast the song is, etc. Here, I ended up with the buckram. You see that on a few of these tracks, but I plugged in some sense here to show a couple of things. So this is what this sounds like with the buckram. And like, why don't we do a solo on the vocal here real quick? This is what it sounds like. I've been down for you, now we up. Baby, me and you, now we stuck. Now we and you hear this like a very bright, clean, not intrusive vocal reverb. It doesn't muddy up the vocal at all, but it gives it some space. At the same time, it still is quite forward. I'm going to play it one more time. Listen to the end when she stops singing every time and hear, hear that tail. I've been down for you, now we up. Baby, me and you, now we stuck. Now we... And it is plate like you know so if i go to the plate you get you're gonna get a similar feeling but the actual the timing of the tail not the length but the way it comes after the vocal changes a little bit so let me give you just this kind of idea real quick like this i've been down for you now we up baby me and you now we stuck now we and the way I would describe it to myself is the A plate goes a little bit like, ooh, are we up? Ooh. And the other one, the buckram goes more like, now we up, Yip. kind of like this. Like these are feelings, right? This is not full description of what it exactly sounds like, but that's what I hear as a difference. And if I actually take off the dry signal, if I can do it here, then this is what the buckram sounds like. I'll open it up here. And very subtly so, the A plate is different. Now, both of these would be okay choices, of course. What we do as mixers is we have our intentions and we have our preferences. So this is how I get to choose these. I also wanna say something, I am kind of a plate kind of person. Over the years, I tried many combinations and for instance, many reverbs come up with like a large hall as the first preset. And to quote the great Alan Myerson, you know, why not use the first preset? Because basically that's probably what sounds best in the box because they're trying to show off the box. I'm totally with that. But I always felt that the hall, the halls themselves, they sounded more cluttered in the lower mids than the plates. And the plates have this splashy high end that I can use to give the record's a little bit of excitement, a little bit of like, hey, here we are. The vocal is not just bright, but also it's bright in space, so to speak. And then also, if you are a fan of uh, subtractive synthesis, what, like I am, you know, when you have a keyboard patch that's very bright, you take the filter, turn it down, and now it becomes darker and darker and darker. And that's one way to create musical sounds, of course. So. In my feeling, it is like if I have a bright reverb tail, then I actually can tailor that down with like high damp or EQ, etc., to just make it fit my record better. 
But if it's already dark, there's nothing I can do except for send more bright sounds in it. So basically, my approach is like, give me a, more frequencies that I can use, and then I can basically dampen them down the way I want them to be. And let me show you that real quick, actually. That's, that's kind of cool, because it's one of the... One of the features of many reverbs, but of course this one has it. So let's go to this bug ram, turn the lead vocal back on and go to the quick page. Even though, I mean, here's all the details. This is a beast of a plugin. But let's go on the quick page. See the high frequency damp over here? It's at 2700 hertz. So it's pretty, pretty bright. So I can actually darken that quite a bit if I want to. Let's, let's try that. I've been down for you, now we up. Actually, let, let me turn off the drive for a moment so you see the movement, and then we'll turn it back on, like this. Dark. Very bright. And then I might end up somewhere around the two kilohertz range, which is obviously where the vocal is. That's kind of where I decide, hey, do you want to be a little bit more out of the way of the vocal or more apparent? So let's try it. It was by a 2.7 and then turn it down to like two with the vocal. I've been down for you, now we up. And then do it darker like this. I've been down for you, now we up. And you can really like tailor the tail around the vocal at that point. And let me say something about two other important parameters. One is obviously RTM, which is the length of the reverb. Buck RAM is a little bit deceptive, I feel. It feels like it's always shorter than the A plate, for instance. Like a normal range for me for vocal reverb is somewhere 1.7 seconds to maybe 2.2. That's normal. Shorter than that, and, and I think of it as short and longer, I think of it as long. But for some reason in the Buck RAM, the way it reacts, like at 1.4, it is kind of what the A plate does at 1.7 or 2. This is important for you, I think, because people ask me often, like, how do you choose a reverb length? Well, there's kind of a bunch of different ways to do so. Like, on a more mathematical level, what you could do, you could take the length of one bar and one beat, which makes a reverb tail basically last for the whole bar and just a little bit more. So it often that works with the music. Now, secondly, you could also use a long reverb time in the plate, basically, make it pretty bright. And like I said, you can just take the high frequency damp and then turn it down until, even though the reverb is still long, it kind of feels like the noticeable part of the reverb is already disappeared a little bit earlier. Those two are pretty good, but I must say that I don't use either on the daily, I basically go by feel. No? So now that I feel where the music comes in, I'm like, okay, that seems a little long, that seems a little short, etc. And of course, the faster the song is, the more likely I will go from A play to buck ram, from something longer to something shorter to support the feeling of the rhythm. Again, I think feel works better, but you have to start somewhere. Now, let's talk about the pre-delay for a moment. A lot of people say, okay, pre-delay is super important, to make sure your lead vocal stays in front while the tail is kind of in the back, so like it deconnects them a little bit. And that's true, fully true. I find it having much less impact than you actually think. It's more subtle than you think. So like for instance, if I take this and put the pre-delay to zero, it sounds like this. I've been down for you, now we up. Baby, me and you, now we stuck. And if I put it at a decent other number, let's say 74, it doesn't sound all that different. Let's check it out. I've been down for you, now we up. Baby, me and you, now we stuck. Of course, you hear the difference. And if that's important to you, that is great. It's not 100% important to me. And then once you get into like, let's say 180 or so, then it becomes a musical event that might be good or bad, like this. I've been down for you, now we up. Baby, me and you, now we stuck, now we... It is, uh, as you know, as if the tail gets totally disconnected from the vocal. And that's, again, creatively, is that good or bad? It depends on the situation. If you're actually interested in kind of having the pre-delay be relating to the tempo of the song, which is interesting, I don't do it always, 
but it's an interesting approach. I do like pre-delay between 50 milliseconds and 100, let's say. The 180, again, that's kind of more in the actual range where it becomes a musical event. But beforehand, if you do it between 50 and 100, you can actually calculate what refers to the tempo. And again, one of the easier parts is to like, let's say go to a 30 second note grid and grid it. There you go. Do one for now and you get the length of 96. So 96 might be interesting. So somewhere if you land between 50 and 100, but it's somewhere related to the tempo, that's a pretty good approach. So I wanted to show you the Auto Park 2, which is kind of like more splashy, darker reverb that gives me more length because I kind of like to have a little bit of an option of a length that I can basically mix into it with the other plate if I wish, you know. This comes in handy for a ballad. Check this out for a moment. This is the reverb only. And it's... It's pretty long, kind of like that. And then if I wanted to, I take, let's say the buckram for the top, so to speak, and the auto park for the bottom or the length of it. And it sounds together like this. And together with the vocal, actually like this. I've been down for you, now we up. I've been down for you, now we up. And I get a little bit the best of both worlds, like a length that I control and also a brightness that I control. I like that. So let me show you a little bit of something that's important to me, especially on vocal reverse. I do DS on the way in quite a bit. I kind of feel like the brightness of the vocal should hit the reverb, but not all the consonants and the S's because then you get a lot of this. I'm overdoing that a little bit, but you get the idea. So basically, I don't really care what the DSing sounds like. Like it, it might be too much because we have the dry signal, of course. But check this out how far I'm pushing this on this one. Let's see, I play it. I've been down for you, now we up. Baby, me and you, now we stuck. You know, now like really kind of knocking those S's out so they don't even hit the reverb at all. And then on the way back, well, you see this on this, I do cut out a bunch of the mud. And for me, my idea is like, I want the idea of like having a splashy reverb that gives me the idea of this vocal has reverb, this vocal has space, this vocal has, let's say, an excitement, but I don't want any of the cluttering low end. So if I take that out for a moment, it becomes this. I've been down for you, now we up. Baby, me and you, now we stuck. I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like an oil barrel, like a low mid kind of buildup that I don't need in this reverb. So I start at a pretty low cut kind of place. And you can do things like that in most reverbs inside the reverb too, but for me, it's just easier to use an EQ right afterwards. And here's yet another idea for you. So let's think about the actual dry signal of the vocal being EQ'd very often very often vocals get EQ'd brighter, especially these days. It almost doesn't matter what mic you record with, we add a lot of brightness to them. And so I do this in return, so you see a little bit more of brightness here. You see the cool Mac DSP plugin, which also will have a little bit of brightness, though I added some body too. Okay, fine. But in general, I push up brightness on all Vox, and I do it there most of the time because you get a slightly darker scent to the reverb than the actual final output of the vocal sound. So I think that's kind of cool because you're already controlling how much brightness you're sending into that reverb and you can get a little bit better control of what is actually being excited by the reverb. And all that being said, you could also say, hey, I need to trigger that reverb more brightly. So you, whatever, you take this EQ and push it into the actual vocal channel and then your reverb will be a little brighter, you know? So these are kind of little places where we can affect the sound and the way the reverb is kind of enveloping a vocal. I do have another one here, the Valhalla. They also make great plugins, of course, and this is a very, very popular reverb right now. What you see here is the same thing for me, low cut 500. I don't want any of the mud. 
The base multiplier, in case you know, like shows you how much the base frequencies actually get triggered and how long they stay around, so to speak. I always have that pretty short. Like if this setting came up from the preset menu, I probably would have tweaked it. And let's see if I can show that. Turn it off for a moment. And then take it longer here. You see the longer low end comes through much longer. So these are important parameters to actually tailor the sound around your vocal. This is always a longer verb. This, this falls to me a little bit more like this is almost an effect. And because let's say you have a hip hop record, very often this is kind of like an ad lib sound where like the ad libs are drained in this kind of reverb. So this is less like, hey, I want some reverb. And this is more like, hey, I want my actual vocal sound to be inside of reverb, so to speak. So now I actually opened a second session. So I went on from Leela James and went to an artist, Dana Wang from RCI Records in China, did well for her. The reason I wanted to do that is I wanted to show you kind of the same approach here with the vocals, you know, the same buckram plate auto park package that I'm using and well, and the Valhalla if you want to. And basically in this case, I'm using it as, as a mix between the three. And similar to the last thing on the Vox, all this, a lot of high end being added. And so if I play this one, Kind of like that. So more singer-songwriter vibe. For this vocal, similar thing, bright, forward vocals, etc. And here you see dual shift is kind of a left-right micro shift thing. So I'm gonna ignore that for now. But everything else, you have the auto park. You have the buckram and you have, well, in this case, a bounce delay. These are the two kind of reverbs I'm mixing. It sounds like this together. It has that quality of like the brightness of the plate and the kind of a little longer tail of the auto park. I love that kind of stuff. Wanted to mention a couple of things here. Check this. The buck ram is almost exactly at zero, right? And the auto parks almost also exactly at zero. And that's the send. What helps a lot, and this is kind of like a little bit housekeeping for me, is when I put something at zero, the reverb return is set in a way that makes sense. Like it's my most favorite reverb level. Obviously, there's no such thing, but it's a reasonable reverb return, not a random one, not too soft, not too loud, just something. If I put a zero send on my track, a reasonable amount of reverb will come back every time. And that's why these returns here, this, that have different levels. Sorry, they're in, in auto trim, so you could see it better here, minus 13, minus three, because if I send, let's say, this vocal to the buck ram at zero. Yeah, destroy the mix now, which is fine. Um, it comes back as this amount of reverb. Did I re which is, anybody would say, that's a reasonable amount, not too much, not too little. And the same for the auto park, I'll put it at zero. Did I re it's lower, but it's kind of where I would start with that kind of reverb anyway. So if you have a plan of your gain staging, of you know, the way you use your often used processes like this, then you can move faster because you go like, okay, fine, the background, probably. Okay, try it, boom, good. Uh, a plate, probably. And they will always come back at a reasonable amount. So let's move on from the vocals for a moment. We've talked a lot about that, I think. So here's something about the instruments, because I was saying, I'm trying to create some kind of ambience that makes the instruments feel cohesive, that they were in a in related spaces, not the same space, but related spaces. So as you can see, and this is one last thing on the session template, you see this send is a concert hall, three concert hall, seven fat ambience, five ambience, F9, which is the true ambience, I have another one normally that's one 
you know, want stereo ambience. The reason I do this same thing, I basically have all my odd number synths there. So search stereo ambience at three, one, concert hall at three. So it gets me faster to the send that I want to get to. And actually, for that matter, I do have the even numbers for delays. So two is half, four is quarter, six is sixteenth. What I look for a lot, and this is what we were talking about, the ambient stuff, right? So like, I like ambiences that are short, that basically give me an option of a probably dry recorded track, maybe in a recorded in a small booth. I wanted to give it some space, a tiny bit of excitement maybe, just a way to not just say, okay, here's a level and it's, here's a pan. I also want to be able to push it forwards and backwards a little bit and that ambiences are great for that. Also because they normally don't have a long tail, they're not cluttering the rest of the instruments. So that's very helpful to me. Let's see what we got here. We got here a little guitar. I'm mean, just gonna turn this off for a moment. Just dry guitar, not, nothing too special. That is about as uh, straightforward as it gets. It's not a particularly great recording or anything. That's great. A, a random track we might be getting from a person. So I use the Fat Ambience, which is a sample actually of my SPX 990. In this case, we're using the Revolver plugin from Mac DSP, which it's a really cool plugin because I can actually sample your reverb. So I sampled all the hardware reverbs that I liked into this plugin, except for the 480, because the Relab already nailed the 480, so I didn't need to do that. So this is a very short ambience. Let me show you if I can. I'm going to turn it up really loud to see if you can hear it. And maybe without the dry. What I really like about it, it kind of sounds like a natural short room to me, and it basically just gives space around the instrument. And what's cool about this, and this is this is something that I noticed by accident. I used to have two of these. I used to have two SPX 990s. And they had mono ins each and had stereo outs and I panned the stereo outs to the side. So what I could do now is something that I call true stereo. I know I'm not using this term 100% right. Martin from Relab would know that, but let's go with this. In my definition, true stereo means you can pan into a reverb like pan the send, and the output follows the reverb, which means I pan the guitar to the left and the reverb kind of comes out of the left too, even though it might be stereo. So it might be around the instrument, but more on the left. And then once I pan it, it follows. So now when I recreated it, a happy accident happened. I did not know that the Mac DSP Revolver was actually true stereo to begin with. So I sampled it and check this out. If I sent just the guitar to this reverb with something that's called FMP, follows main pan, then basically I can pan the guitar and the send also follows what I'm doing here, right? So now what happens, and it's pretty easy to hear when I turn off the direct signal, is the reverb is actually following that panning. Let me see if I can do that. So this is a great way to clean up your record because basically your reverb only comes out of places that you need it to come out of. So, but the happy accident I was mentioning is like, oh, I did not know that. So in that case, I can set up a couple of other ambiences, which just happens to be the same program, but these are mono. And what I do here, it's a slightly different application. This one also follows my pan, which is cool. But it actually, the return is mono, like this. So it also follows my instrument, but it actually, I can place that mono reverb directly behind the guitar and leave it there. So now I can decide the guitar, half to the left with a reverb that's skinny behind it, or the guitar half to the left and with a reverb that's wide behind it just from a couple of cents. I do also use this other plugin, that's SAR Reverb, which is cool. And I also use the Relab Quantex, which I have right here. Come on, there it is.
Hey, and that one has some Richard Furch presets in it. Very happy about that. Hey, they, they even used my picture. Thank you so much. But you hear all of these ambience programs are really short, splashy, get out of the way fast, but they can move these guitars into different places. Well, I obviously use it in other places too. I have used them on vocals too. Like if I want, let's say the double wants to stand a little back from the lead vocal, I might add one of the ambiences on top of that. I should probably not forget to say that even delays, like for instance, 16th note delays, that can give you a sense of ambience, right? So I do it loud like this. That's obviously too loud. That becomes a musical event, which you might or might not want. Or you turn it down. Without. With. And because the 16th note, the day is so close to the original in level, it becomes one and it's not a musical event anymore really, but more a spatial event. So these are moments where I can take an instrument and kind of push it slightly further away, which is great because the stuff that's fully dry will stick in front of it. And so I have one more level or maybe even more depending on which different ambiences I use, different ways of pushing it back. And I love that. I want to say one thing more that you can do, which is a really cool thing with the true verb. I don't know if you guys know true verb. People mentioned it recently again, but I, uh, I started using it like, I don't know, a long time ago, too long. And uh, it's actually a distance processor. I think that's what Waves actually calls it. What's really cool is you can say this blue line is the size of the room and the yellow line is how far into that room the instrument sits. So at the front, it would be like this. You only have to turn this on here, by the way. Direct shows the direct signal, makes sense. And once you press early reflections, stuff actually happens. So let me see if I can show this, but it moves like this, that's the front. And then you move it back here. and a little bit further back. These are all parts in the tool set of making stuff move forward and back. So let's talk about a little bit more here, the concert hall. You see again, this is at zero, like I said, because I set all my sense in a way that gives me a reasonable return from the effect. Let's try this with the piano. So you see the concert hall, when I play it dry, Stay for it. a little dark, but that's the tone they had. And then with the concert hall. The brightness of the concert hall gives it a little bit more presence, which I love. And I want to say something about the concert hall because <laughs> Bob Clemon said on his website, I have a PCM70 and it's on concert hall and it's the bomb on pianos. <laughs> That's where I read it. I know this for a fact, I read that. So here's the thing, very often with this presentation or what we see on the internet or wherever you watch and get your information, somebody will say and show something and you will understand it in your own way. You probably won't understand it exactly the way they meant it. And maybe there might be even a little bit of confusion about the whole thing. But here's the beautiful part. So whatever Bob Clearmountain said about this PCM70 being the bomb, I did get not quite right. Mine didn't sound like that. My PCM70 was a little tweaked. The idea was the idea that he had, but the sound that came out is something that I nurtured. So imagine how cool that is that you can find misinformation somewhere or not quite complete information and use it as a starting point for your own travels. So this is what I'm taking from here too. I get information, I distill it through the way I hear music, the way I plan my sessions and something else came out. And this is now my way. And if you take this way, I hope that yours will develop into your way, which is really what this whole thing is about. It's kind of beautiful. And this is actually where I wanted to like hark back to the first session. Remember that vocal track that was on three tracks where, where somebody could have said, that's nuts. Or somebody could have said, that's always how Richard first does vocals. Both would be wrong, right? But it is a technique that was valuable. So again, if you take that 
slightly wrong information and do something positive with it, then we all grow. I just wanted to say something about my most hated thing about reverbs or <laughs> the way people use reverbs now. Not really. I see a lot of sessions that I get and people use reverbs on inserts and I use the mix knob in order to dial in their verb. And I always go like, well, I wish you wouldn't do that. Okay, let me start with the obvious. No, it does not sound different than an aux send return setup. That's not true. That's, it will sound the same. But that being said, and I want to show that to you and maybe you take that to heart. When you use a mix knob like this and you plug it in on this acoustic guitar, let's say first for a moment, let me play it without. Now, if I use the reverb, the mix knob here and try to dial in the actual reverb level, the following happens. The dry of the actual guitar will go down while the reverb goes up like this. Maybe you like that level. Here's the problem. The problem is somebody asking for dry stems, you take that off the level jumps. That sucks. Or you're mixing for somebody and they says, oh, I love everything about this mix, except for the acoustic guitar is too wet. You're like, no problem. You change the dry wet again, and now the guitar level changed. So now you have to trace the level of the actual guitar that you wanted to have, like the musical level, because it changes while you change an effect. So here's a way around, of course, you send the same thing to the same reverb, except for it's on ascent now, and it sounds like this. So basically, whatever level you come up with, the actual dry signal will stay the same, and that's fantastic because that's easier to work with. So if you can, work this way. There's only a few plugins that can do this correctly or better because it has a dry and a wet slider. So on that one, I can actually, let me turn off the other reverb, I can get something fully dry. I can add reverb as much as I want. And the dry stays the same and I adjust it again. All that being said, I do like bright stuff, thin reverbs that do not clutter the sound stage uh, uncontrollably, etc. And plates, reverb, and ambiences, splashy things, as we talked about. I do use halls and studios, etc. too, especially on stuff that is supposed to be like further away, like strings, for instance. Check this out. We have. short, but with a little warmth on it, could be a hall. In this case, I know it's a studio. And that's the Reverb 6000 from Relab, which models one of those Danish reverbs. I always have two reverbs on this send because I click back and forth which one I like. Here's also a really old school one, the Revive one. That's the studio, and I, I, I do like that one. Check this out. And that one, as you can see, it has no low cut on it afterwards, because here I want to have that enveloping feeling. So I have the option to do something that's more like, ah, open like this, but we ended up with a 6,000 here. All right, I hope you liked our deep dive into reverbs and ambiences and the stuff that's between the tracks, so to speak. And I hope you find your own little nuggets and inspirations in what I said. And I hope you develop it further and find your own ways and decide what you like and what you don't like, because that's really what it's about. Your idea, your taste, your approach to the music, that's why we're making these records. Uh, we're trying to make new records, we're trying to further the craft. There will be people out there that like your approach the best, <laughs> and those will be your clients and friends, etc. And I'm just so interested to hear what you come up with. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Sonic Scoop and Justin Coletti for making this happen. 
Thanks for Relab and the two Randys and Martin for actually putting this on. And Matt, our uh, videographer here, to point stuff at me and let me talk and wax poetic about something that's pretty important to me. And I think it's very, very valuable. And it's also very, very powerful once you find your own way. Thank you for watching. All right, I hope you enjoyed that masterclass with Richard Furch as much as I did. Big thanks to Richard Furch. I think he had some great insights in how to use reverb, how to think about reverb, how to hear it, what to listen for, and how to treat your reverbs in the mix. If you want to check out any of the Relab plugins that he used in this masterclass, check them out over at relabdevelopment.com. They make some truly excellent reverbs, including the LX480, which is an exact sample accurate emulation of the original classic hardware Lexicon 480 reverbs that were in all of the biggest studios in the world until last Tuesday, or actually still in most of the major studios in the world today. But you don't have to own the hardware anymore. Just like Richard sold his hardware, you can get the plug-in and it does sound amazing. They also have that new Rev 6000, which emulates those classic TC electronics reverbs that have been found in so many studios throughout the years. And these are reverbs that just immediately sound right. They have so much other stuff to check out as well, like the Sontec, the QuantX, and probably my favorite, the Masilek MEA2 EQ, which is the EQ I learned how to EQ on, and it makes it into my mastering template on every session these days. So big thanks again to Richard, and big thanks again to Relab. Try their stuff out for free over at relabdevelopment.com. Speaking of free, if you want some totally free stuff, sign up for the MixCon Mega Giveaway, where you have three chances to win more than $5,000 worth of free gear, including free plugins, free microphones, free speakers, and a whole bunch more. We'll leave the link for that in the comments and in the description down below. If you're here for the live premiere, or even if you're watching this years in the future, check out the live Q&A that we are doing with Richard right after this concludes. We'll be taking all of the best questions that came in during this presentation, and we'll be taking new questions for you over in that link. So check it out. I hope to see you there.